Yes. So as we know, suicide is an issue that affects all countries and South Africa is no exception. There is much that has been and can still be done to prevent suicide in our country. This International Suicide Prevention Day Ways for Change and the South African Federation for Mental Health have come together with key experts to hold the space for dialogue, education and advocacy in their joint webinar titled Suicide Prevention in South Africa. So I'm going to hand over to Barty from the South African Federation for Mental Health and Nikki from Ways for Change just to do an introduction um, for the two organizations. So I'll hand over to Barty first. Good morning. Thank you, Jandre. Um, I am Bharti Patel. I am from the South African Federation for Mental Health. And it is really a pleasure to co-host this webinar this morning. Um, the South African Federation for Mental Health, we are a national mental health advocacy movement. Um, and we do awareness as well. We are constituted by 17 member organizations across South Africa. Um, and we are the largest federation um, for mental health in the country. Um, just a bit about the work that our member organizations do. They provide social care and rehabilitation programs um, that help people to participate in the community. And one of the programs that are offered by our member organizations is around suicide prevention uh, by arranging awareness programs in communities. And most importantly, many of these awareness programs are held among school children. Uh, now, because these organizations are located within communities, they are accessible, they are affordable because their services are free and they, they're available in the community. So anyone who needs information, advice, or referral to a mental health or related service uh, can get help readily. Of course, we would like to see that these services are available in every district. So investment into these organizations and services by government and the private sector is absolutely critical. At a national level, the Federation runs a help desk uh, and it serves as a referral resource to anyone that is looking for mental health services in the country. We work closely with government and the NGO sector, as well as with other national and international organizations to make mental health a reality for all. And we do so by advocating for better mental health policy and legislation so that we can address the needs of citizens in the country. So we also create awareness uh, on mental health. And like I said at the beginning, it is a privilege to be able to partner with Waves for Change today to be able to have this webinar so that information around mental health can be shared and that more people will receive um, mental health care in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Barty. Um, thank you, everyone. My name is Nikki van Merwe, and I work for Ways for Change. I oversee our monitoring, evaluation, research, and learning. Um, and Ways for Change is a community um, provides a community-based child-friendly mental health service in under-resourced communities where we know the children and young people we work with face chronic adversity. Um, it's ongoing exposure to environmental stresses such as poverty and violence. And we know that results in toxic stress and toxic stress changes the part of the developing brain um, that deals with self-regulation, decision-making, setting goals, and um, all of the necessary skills these children and young people need um, to function in, in these um, environments that, that um, cause uh, toxic stress. Um, and we also know um, the most recent child cage that was um, released in 2022 
and pointed out that less than 10% of young people in adolescents um, have, that need mental health support have access to that. And there's various reasons for that. It might be a, a really an overburdened health system. It might be a shortage of culturally and age appropriate mental health services, um, lack of facilities, um, and, and just too, too few trained um, professionals. We also know that mental health um, challenges and, and like depression, anxiety, suicide, or taboo topics. Um, people are reluctant to speak about these topics. Parents don't know how to speak to their children about these topics. So in general, there's not a space where um, this less than 10% um, need can be addressed. Um, and at Ways for Change, our focus is on mental health promotion and primary prevention work. Um, and we um, aim to increase the protective factors um, for children in these adverse um, environments. And we know things like social connectedness, positive um, connections to peers, a sense of belonging, a community that's supportive around them are all uh, protective factors to develop more serious mental health challenges than like depression, anxiety, and societality. Um, we have, however, in the past had um, concerns and incidents raised where there's been more serious mental health challenges like depression, severe cases of depression, anxiety, and suicidality in, in some of the young people where we work. And um, we're fortunate that we've got a really well-established child protection and safeguarding team who can respond to these cases appropriately. But we're also really fortunate that over the past couple of years with our advocacy and policy work that we formed relationships such as these and some of the experts that's on this panel. So we make sure that through our direct service delivery, we contribute um, to, to this overburdened um, health system, but that we also have, we know where our work starts and where it stops and that we can refer some of these cases that's outside of the scope of our work to, to these partnerships that, that's on the panel today. So it's really an honor for us today to be to be able to facilitate this space, but also to um, be part of part of this conversation um, and um, that we can have more of these. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Barty and Nikki. Thank you so much for sharing why such organizations are committed to this cause. It's so important. Um, we're going to head over to our panel, but before we do so, I think it's important that the panelists maybe introduce himself. <laughs> just to say where they are and where they are from. Um, so I'm gonna start with Venetia. Venetia, floor is yours. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So I'm Venetia Gordon. I'm the operations manager at SADAG, the South African Depression and Anxiety Group. And we run nationwide helplines as well as the only national suicide crisis helpline there is in this country. We've been running it for over 28 years. And SADAG has always done a lot of work with regards to you know, sharing information, sharing, sharing warning signs, sharing the symptoms and providing services. Perfect. Thank you so much, Venetia. Next on my screen is Mabisa. Thank you so much, Andre. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Mabisa Chefu. I am from the um, South African College of Applied Psychology, um, and I'm the head of student support and development. So we are an academic institution, um, and my role is really centered around the provision of um, various support interventions for our student bodies. So this ranges from academic to psychosocial support um, and student development uh, projects and opportunities. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Norvisa. Next on my screen is Marcella. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm Marcella. I have um, almost a, a full lifetime of experience regarding suicide and uh, suicide ideation, suicide behavior. Um, and um, this is something that is really, really close to my heart. And as human beings, we've got to do better. Um, yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Thank you so much for that introduction, Marcella. Next up is Lorraine. Hi, um, yes, I'm Lorraine Mitchell and I am a clinical social worker. Uh, in South Africa, I developed um, uh, a business uh, we, we called um, ourselves Suicide Survivors 
um, and the intention was to to really immerse ourselves with understanding in terms of suicide um, as well as as being able to equip uh, clinicians and uh, everybody uh, in terms of, of being suicide alert and being able to to help those who are struggling with suicidal thoughts um, and are in that really dark space. Um, I'm currently the suicide prevention lead and uh, trainer um, in the UK. So I'm working um, in Kent and Midway in, in, the, in the United Kingdom at this point in time. Thank you for that intro, Lorraine. And next up, we have Shomei. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. I am Shomei Mojabelu. I'm a clinical psychologist uh, in private practice. I am also a lecturer in the Department of Psychology at UNISA. Um, I'm involved in the training and selection team there as well in the clinical master's program. I am also a PhD student and yeah, on a personal level also have experience um, in the sense that I have lost family members, including a sister uh, to suicide as well. So really important conversation and looking forward to um, speaking to you all. Thank you so much, Romaine. Just before we get into our panel discussion, if you have any questions, please pop them into the chat and we will try to get in all of them later on in the conversation. So it's time for us to seek some expertise from our panel. So the first question is to Venetia. SADAC has South Africa's only 24 7 suicide crisis outline. Could you shed some light why SADAC's work is an important aspect of suicide prevention in South Africa? and our strategic partnerships help make the service more accessible. So it's so important to note that even though we've been running the National Suicide Crisis Helpline for over 28 years now, is that we also have various other helplines. And all of these helplines provide the service of, you know, when a person is not feeling well or they're overwhelmed or stressed, the counselor is there to chat to them, to speak to them, to help them in that space, and to also then provide them with coping skills, with um, self-help uh, tips, and also then with referrals thereafter that they can actually use in their day-to-day -day, um, life. It's important to know that also like with, with regards to what we do for Suicide Prevention Day, it actually starts from the beginning of September where we plan Facebook Friday conversations. So if you've been on our Facebook Friday, every Friday we have a different conversation with an expert highlighting different topics that's so valuable to our society. We also have coming up this month, uh, Twitter spaces conversations as well as various other activations. We also have very um, recently from the beginning of this year have started peer support groups. So support groups have been around for many years since the beginning of SADAG and it's been a space, a safe space for people to share their experiences, to gain coping skills and also offer support to each other. So knowing that you're not alone when you having a mental health, um, when you have a mental health diagnosis or you're not feeling well. Just to understand that you know, there's extra support um, other people feel the same way as I do. I'm not alone in this situation. It helps you just feel a little bit better in your day and helps you cope better in your in your for your quality of your life. Um, we also have those peer support groups that we started nationwide um, this year, and it's been going wonderfully. Where the students have that ability to share, connect, and actually experience that sense of support. Uh, we run our our helplines run 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. So there is no downtime. Sadag is always available for anyone that needs that resource or is feeling stressed out or overwhelmed. Um, I wanted to actually mention is that um, you know all the activations. If you go to our website, you'll be able to find toolkits, articles, videos, as well as previous webinars that we've done. In addition to that, SADAC has always been one of those spaces where, and I've mentioned earlier, is that we, we always want to change that narrative around mental health, change that narrative around speaking about suicide. So sharing the warning signs, sharing the myths around suicidal ideation, also sharing the signs and symptoms so that loved ones can actually pick up, they're like, you know, I've noticed that um, 
my son, daughter, family member hasn't been looking after themselves. They're isolating themselves. They're not feeling well. So maybe I need to have this conversation with them, but how do I do that? And that's often the information that Sadek is always sharing, just how to start this conversation, how to have these conversations and also bring to light that, you know, I've noticed that you're not feeling well. I've noticed it. And often people will actually say that, I'm glad that someone noticed I'm not doing well in this space. So I hope that um, touches on on anything. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to always answer. Thank you so much for that, Venetia. It's so important to hear that you guys have all of these activations available that create support, because that is extremely important. So thank you so much for that, for that answer. Lorraine, the next question is posed to you. you. You have worked extensively as a suicide prevention specialist for almost 18 years. During this time, what interventions have you found to be effective in preventing suicide? And what makes them work? And why do these sorts of interventions work? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Dre. So um, I think we are aware that there are multiple uh, programs that are available um, out there, you know, uh, Safe Talk, Assist, Zero Suicide, um, Storm, lots of, you know, there's been lots of developed programs but what i find is the most effective is 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 touching on a little bit about what's already been said um in terms of the fact that the person that we're working with that is in that really dark space um and and just absolutely does not think that there is any hope um it's a it's a place of incredible emotional pain um, and and I just want to escape that emotional pain. Um, so for me, it, it, I almost kind of consider that the work with someone who is who is suicidal is it's a journey, um, and there are a number of milestones on this journey that we need to to be able to meet. Um, but the most important part of that journey is the connection, is our relationship. Uh, very often, you know, and and Thomas Joyner who. Um, speaks of an interpersonal uh, theory of suicide. He talks about there being a, a sense of being a burden on the people around me. And even though the people, if you spoke to the people around that that person who is experiencing suicidal ideation, they would they would deny that they that this person is a burden. But they truly, truly believe that they're a burden on the people around them, and that they're alone. No one understands. No one will really care. Um, and they feel that, you know, I don't belong. In fact, if I then complete a suicide, it's probably going to, you know, it's gonna, my, my family would be better off without me. So those are some of the skew th uh, thinking that, that that person is experiencing. So for me, the most important factor in working with someone who's, who's suicidal is about the relationship, about the connection. It's almost like my, uh, relation and this can be anybody whether I'm a clinician whether I'm working you know face to face with clients who are suicidal or whether I'm having lunch with my my sister or my or a friend that is expressing um, these suicidal thoughts it is about a being willing to talk that for me is the biggest key area is that I'm not afraid to talk about suicide I'll use the word suicide um, and I know that I'm not going to be putting, you know, suicide into people's minds. Um, you know, that is a myth to think that if I talk about suicide, maybe they will consider it as an option. Um, but what is, what does actually happen is when I talk about it, you will see almost a physical response, which is relief. Um, Somebody is willing to go there. They're willing to talk uh, talk through all of these thoughts, which are obsessive, obsessive and um, persistent, you know, wanting to end, end my pain because that's what suicide is. It's not about wanting to die. It's about wanting to find a way in which to end this emotional pain. Um, so in so many ways, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, kind of learning the language of suicide, being able to be alert and kind of think, you know, I'm hearing all the warning signs, they're ticking boxes, and then it's being willing to say, okay, let's talk about this. And asking, are you thinking of suicide? Do you have suicidal thoughts? Um, and, and to put it on the table confidently, directly, clearly, 
Uh, and then that person is thinking, wow, here's somebody who wants to get into this really dark space with me. They really want to know what's brought suicide into my life. Um, and they, they, they care. And so that relationship is almost a microcosm of, of the fact that I, that other people could also, you know, kind of care and, and uh, you know, be able to, to, to walk this road with me. So there are lots of kind of milestones on this journey. We, we again, talking about suicide, removing those kind of the stigmatization, um, the taboo. We know that suicide d d grows in silence. Um, and in isolation. So it is so important. And uh, Venetia spoke about peer support and, you know, kind of just enabling through the counseling line to have a point of connection. And I think that's the most important part. I mean, the other, the other tasks will come in terms of developing safety plans, talking through the suicide plan, um, uh, you know, removing access to the means by which, you know, so if I have a plan to stop my medication and um, and alcohol, then the intention is to dis disable that plan, remove the access, easy access to that, to, to the, the, the means by which I'm thinking to die. So those, those will come, but they, but the most important part of our relationship is the connection, um, that we form empathically without judgment, with understanding. Um, and it doesn't mean I need to have experienced this in order to be able to get into that really dark space with someone, but it is about saying I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to talk about suicide and I'm willing to, to be a support in whichever way that looks for, for the person who's in that, um, you know, kind of really space of, of, of incredible pain. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, yeah, just some of the things that I took out from you sharing was understanding that it's a journey um, and that it's, it's an actual relationship, it's a connection and the willingness to speak, to talk about it, um, because a large portion of the time it goes silent, but actually to speak about it, to make the person aware that you, you understand, you, you are there. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that, Ray. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move over to Shomay. So, Shomain, you are a practicing clinician, and I'm sure you've had clients with experience working with persons who have survived suicide attempts or suicidal ideations. How do you practice or share prevention interventions with those you work with? Thanks, John Ray. Um, we intervene on various levels, starting from the individual all the way to the community. Um, but I think, I mean, we all know that uh, each um, instance or people in general, each process is quite unique. And so when we do intervene, we do consider various aspects of this client or these clients within their context, uh, which include their age, their gender, their religious background, etc. cetera. Um, when we intervene on an individual level, psychotherapy is one of the evidence-based intervention uh, kind of processes that we bring in. Um, along with that, usually assessment is involved, and that can either be emotional assessments or, uh, if necessary, neuropsychological assessments, because uh, we also know that suicidal behavior or ideation can be related to physiological factors as well and not just um, mental health uh, illnesses. Um, and then, of course, we diagnose uh, and through the diagnosis, then we're able to then assist the client and give that specific uh, evidence based uh, treatment uh, that I, I just mentioned about or that I just mentioned. Um, and the diagnosis, of course, is because we know that a lot of suicidal ideation and behavior is related to mental health illnesses, but not exclusive to that as well. Um, meaning that we can't really think linearly about suicidal behavior ideation. It is so complex and deep rooted. Um, and we, when we do diagnose, of course, we do know that they are quite a few hundreds of, of uh, mental disorders or illnesses 
that are related to suicidal uh, behavior or ideation. The most common ones that we know of are major depressive disorders, uh, 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 post-traumatic stress disorder or your PTSD, anxiety disorders, your substance use and related disorders, hundreds and hundreds um, of, of disorders that can be related to suicidal behavior and ideation that we consider uh, when we do diagnose. And then, of course, with the assessments, part of the assessments involves suicide risk assessments. And if uh, we do find that clients are high risk or um, assessed to be high risk, then this is where we always, always bring in a multidisciplinary team that involves other healthcare workers like psychiatrists, for example. Um, and then we, through the process, will refer clients to hospitals, uh, whether that be a medical hospital or psychiatric hospital, uh, just so that they get a minimum of a 72 hour um, assessment. And then we then can continue with, with the psychotherapeutic process. Um, we also are involved with a lot of psychoeducation. That's again, on the various levels, depending on what the client's needs are. Um, we know that psychoeducation is quite important when it comes to suicidal behavior and ideation. Um, we want to highlight quite important things like warning signs, uh, risk factors, protective factors. And I think what is also quite important is that we speak about the language um, or how we speak about suicide as well, or the language around that, because we want to ensure that we remove the stigma that comes along with um, suicidal behavior and suicidal ideation. And we know that if we introduce the, the use of neutral language as we speak about it, this can help with that as well. Um, and then we can also intervene on a level of community or on a broader level. Uh, this means that we work with either governments or NGOs on a private or um, other capacities uh, where we're involved in quite a few programs. Um, for example, we can uh, we usually assist with uh, bullying in high school because we know that bullying is also one of the factors that is associated amongst the younger ones um, uh, with uh, suicidal uh, behavior and ideation. Thank you so much, Shumai. Thank you for sharing. It was so encouraging to hear that each process is unique um, from the individual all the way through to the community. And the different processes that takes place, psychotherapeutic process, the education that's so important and the language that we speak about that is really important. So thank you so much for sharing that. I'm gonna to move to Marcella and perhaps she could jump in here. Um, Marcella, you've recently attended the World Suicide Prevention Summit that, that happened in 2020 and found that the Columbia Protocol resonated with you. Can you speak more about what this protocol is, why it resonated with you and how it might be used as a tool for suicide prevention in South Africa. Thank you. Um, yes, I uh, I attended. I, I I'm a lay person um, who, as I said, have has struggled with suicidality for many years. Um, the Columbia Protocol is to me <laughs> is really, really simple and very, very powerful. It's um, a few questions that can be used by everybody and anybody um, that assesses suicide, the severity of suicidality thoughts and as well as behavior. So it empowers communities, families, individuals, everybody. Um, it's six questions. It's really, really simple. And it resonated with me because I have my first suicidal attempt was at the age of 13. My last was seven years ago. And if somebody had asked me, just taken the time to ask me any of these questions, it would have prevented 
intervention would have been sooner and it would have prevented the trauma of my children that my children have went through finding their mother um, yeah, and having to rush her to hospital. Um, it opens a doorway because the, the, the questions are so simple and so to the point. Um, it opens the door for discussion. So it normalizes, as, as Lillian said, it, normal, it, it becomes normal to discuss suicide, which is huge. Um, in, in the last three years, I have been honored to be a part of a, a community of people that have really held me and um, have looked at my traumas. When I was initially diagnosed, I was labeled. I, I had these beautiful labels on me, which I owned for many years. And those labels defined me until I could reach a point of being with people that was willing to deal with the root and not just my symptoms, not just my ideation, not just my intention of wanting to end my pain, but willing to go back with me and hold me while I looked at the trauma that I experienced as a child. And that is something that hasn't been mentioned here, is we live in a, in a world that is filled with trauma and we can put whatever label we want on people. But if we don't deal with the trauma, <laughs> suicide is just gonna continue. So the Columbia Protocol is really, really something very powerful and if we can implement this in every school every organization if we can just educate people to use these six questions we'll we'll save a lot of lives thank you so much marcella thank you for sharing thank you for sharing your story with us um I agree with you. It's important that we deal with the trauma. It's really important that we do that. So thank you so much. I'm going to move over to Nwabisa. Nwabisa, as a registered counselor and head of student support and development at the South African College for Applied Psychology, how are you as a tertiary organization working to prevent suicide among students? We know this is a group uh, who are at elevated risk for suicide, especially around exam time. Thank you, Chandra. Um, I think just to start off, um, I mean, SACAP really tries to provide um, opportunities from disclosure from the outset, right? So as our students apply um, to be enrolled in the institution, they are able to essentially disclose any um, health conditions, mental health conditions, disabilities that they may have um, and for which they may require support during the course of their studies with CCAP. Um, so the work of uh, the student support and development department, like I said, is partially to provide and oversee psychosocial support. Now, what that looks like or um, on a day-to-day -day basis is we rely on one student's disclosing that they need um, support or assistance, but we are aware that, you know, not everyone is able to say that I need assistance or I'm struggling. Um, so the department really also benefits from collaborations with our educator body who are able to flag or track at-risk students. So, um, and then in addition to this, we also run various programs throughout the year. Um, so programs that are targeted at um, raising awareness, um, providing psychoeducation workshops. These are uh, primarily facilitated by our student support um, advisors, but we also have student registered counselors that are placed at each of our campuses. Um, and the work of the student um, registered counselors is to provide um, counseling services to facilitate workshops. Um, and just recently, we've started working towards 
um, establishing a counseling center. Um, and we, we have a, a counseling a psychology intern currently placed um, um, and sort of focused on getting that started. Now we have various other initiatives like a disability task team that's sitting there. Um, I think though, what is very, very important is even with all of these efforts, um, the work that we can do can only go up to a particular point. Um, if a student is, I guess, understood to be at elevated risk, we do uh, sort of refer externally. Um, so actually organizations like SADAG, Lifeline, Higher Health um, for crisis intervention purposes, um, we also do sort of struggle in situations where we have a student who may not necessarily have the means to access um, a clinical psychologist, for instance, we know what the burden is on our public health care system. Um, so I think there's definitely space um, and a need for sort of the peer su uh, support interventions. I think Lorraine mentioned this, um, and it's such a big focus. Um, for us um, and so sort of starting to work towards getting support groups in place for our students. Um, and I think even outside of sort of like a clinical uh, framework, there's so much that can be, or that stands to be benefited from sort of talking to somebody who not only identifies with your particular situation, but with you and your, your current stance as an individual as well. Um, so peer support is definitely another element um, that we sort of started working towards establishing. Um, we are starting specifically now with uh, a support group for moms who are also enrolled as students, and this is because of the elevated pressures that these students may be uh, sort of placed um, under. Um, sort of in 2021, we also started um, a support group um, intervention for all of our students at the various campuses, uh, which we termed CCAP, support CCAP. Um, and it was through those discussions that actually um, the need for that peer support, ongoing support was highlighted. And almost as though, um, you know, it's actually more valuable, would be more, even more valuable than um, essentially, I don't know, going to um, a clinician for, for support not necessarily to say that that is not important, but again, having someone to walk the journey with you, somebody who has also lived through or is living through the same experience as you do. So we are definitely, um, we try to uh, create those opportunities and platforms for our students at SACAP. Um, in terms of how students do access our support. Um, generally, they can just send emails to the department book consultations. Um, in the event where sort of a risk is identified, even in an academic support consult, for example, those students would be referred to a psycho, uh, psychosocial support service, whether it is through the counselor, or like I said earlier on, depending on the level of risk, to uh, sort of somebody that is more equipped uh, so like an external psychologist um, and that's sort of thing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nwabisa. Uh, it's so encouraging to hear of the opportunities and platforms that you guys have available to the students um, and the referral system that you guys have in place for students that are at risk. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. We're going to move into a rapid fire round. Um, so all the panelists, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to to hear from each of you. I would like to know one, what's one resource, innovation, intervention, or policy you'd want to see for preventing suicide in South Africa? Um, we'll start with Venetia. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Yes. So I think, you know, when it when it comes to suicide prevention, I think it's about, and, and I've mentioned this before, it's about changing that narrative. And I think if policies you know, sort of get framed by the change of narrative, then the more of us, the more, the more we are educated. So the knowledge is definitely power. So the more we educated about how to speak around mental health, how to speak around suicide, how to speak around helping someone that is actually in a distressed space, I think that would change so many conversations and actually allow a lot more people to say, yes, I'm not feeling okay today. Yes, I might need help. And they're not uh, burdened by the stigma associated by just when Marcella mentioned the, the labels, 
you know it's not about the labels it's about how I'm feeling right now and what can I do to help myself and also if I've noticed it in someone else how can I help someone else so I think the narrative needs to be changed the conversations need to be easier and I don't mean by easier that it sh that it is an easy conversation but the, the, the conversations need to be just not as taboo as it is at the moment. It's more open. It's having these open conversations, having parents have these conversations with their little kids, because we do know that suicidal ideation is also impacting the young ones nowadays. And it has been for many years, but now it's been highlighted. So having these open conversations where children can actually say, you know, I'm not doing okay. Teachers being equipped with how do they speak to the student? How do they speak to the parents? How do they then extend the information and share it more with each other so i think that would be my biggest i think for me personally thank you so much venetia uh, lorraine you're up next yes so i mean i would obviously uh, reiterate what venetia said as well um but i think what we need to remember is that that person who's in that really really dark space feels so alone but also feels a lot of shame so so you know we don't just come out outright and say i'm going to kill myself um so it is so important that we as i said earlier learn the language and be willing to talk about suicide so you know people might say and i know when i was you know working with with clients people would say i'm just so exhausted i can't do this anymore i'm so tired um, people would be better off without me. I'm such a failure. And it's being able to identify that sense of, uh, you know, uh, aloneness as well as um, the, the, the emotional pain that that person is, is experiencing. And so for me, the most important connection is about being genuinely interested in someone else compassion, you know, kind of noticing when someone was fine yesterday and is not okay today, and being inquisitive and curious. And it doesn't, you know, it's not that we have to only have those conversations in clinicians' offices. It has to be, you know, at the dinner table with families. It has to be, uh, you know, with friends. Um, we have to talk about suicide. And I think that's kind of the theme that feels like it's emerging today. It's just the importance of, of being able to use the word and, and, and to, to genuinely care about, about the person sitting next to me. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Masara. And if I can just ask ladies if you can just keep it a bit short, because we still have to do a Q&A. There are a few questions that has come up. Um, yeah, I don't want to deter you from your answer, but please, if you don't mind keeping it compact. Thank you. Marcella, over to you. For me, if we can get the... the um, um, Columbia Protocol, the... Um, suicide severity rates um, scale um, as in in every organization in every school um, if it, it, it standardized these questions these six questions are um, they've been developed by um, a psychiatrist um, that works at Columbia University they used everywhere in, in America, in Israel. So if we can do that here, oh man, that's me. Thank you, Marcella. Charmaine? Um, I think I, I did mention, and uh, I agree we're on the same theme uh, as the panelists have started speaking, that psychoeducation is so important. Um, I think, like I mentioned before, that there's so many aspects that we can speak about around suicidal ideation and behavior that will break these labels that, that Marcella started speaking about, where we're able to see people for who they are and to see their experiences because there are so many misconceptions and assumptions about suicidal ideation and behavior. And there's so 
much stigma around it as well. And this is where the labeling comes and, and um, just the, the really horrible conversation around suicidal ideation and, and, and behavior. Um, so if we can speak more about it, I agree. I think Lorraine also mentioned that beyond um, theory, beyond labels, and we just see people for who they are so that we are able to empathize them and understand the experiences, it will make so much, you know, it will make such a difference. And, and of course, these conversations need to go beyond uh, professional spaces. Um, it's so important that we have these conversations at home. It's so important that we have them as often as we can because the one of the warning signs and the common ones are, are that the person may come across as if, if as if they are happy or as if there's an elated mood or you know you you might assume that this person is doing well but this elated mood comes from a deep sense of pain um, uh, as they are planning their suicide and you may not be aware of it so I think it's quite important to continue to have conversations about it. Uh, I guess, as I mentioned, either under the label of psychoeducation or just simple conversations. Thank you, Shomain. Um, Nwabisa. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, um, just piggybacking on what um, actually everyone has said already, one destigmatizing, um, you know, suicide, suicidal, um, behaviors and ideation is definitely a key thing. Um, I think recently we've started seeing, you know, the general mental health discussions or conversations start to gain traction on social media. So making, um, you know, self-harm and suicide an integral part of the day-to-day -day mental health conversation is so pertinent. Um, I think specifically coming from somebody that is in higher education, um, integrating um, or like a framework for um, continuity of care um, for people that have been um, identified as being at risk or who have sort of attempted suicide. So providing those guidelines in terms of how to continue to support those people, so to, to minimize the risk, but also to make sure that they're not feeling this deep sense of isolation that often comes um, to somebody that is experienced by somebody, you know, uh, that is experiencing difficulty with suicidal ideation or suicidal thought. Uh, but then I think more importantly, um, risk assessment training for anybody that is in a role where they come face to face with at risk individuals. So for like the youth, for example, um, we know society is not just a youth problem, but just from the perspective of someone that is in the space that I'm in, making sure that teams that work with students, with young people or people with other sort of what we know to be, you know, comorbid conditions, making sure that they're adequately used, I mean, trained in using uh, specific screening tools. Um, and also just what to do with that information afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Nervisa. Thank you, ladies. There was a lot of pointers there, a lot of tips, a lot of resources, uh, innovations. So thank you so much for sharing that. I hope everyone was taking some notes down. <laughs> I took a few of that was good. Um, we're gonna move over to the Q and A. Um, and so this goes to the entire panel. Um, I'm gonna pose a question and if you feel comfortable to answer them, please. Are there any questions? I think there are a few questions here. I saw someone asking a question while one of the ladies were talking. Sure. There's a lot going on here. <laughs> okay, are there any questions? If you have a question, please uh, put it in the chat. There's a question to Marcelo. 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 Yes. What are the what are the six questions that would help to ask someone who is seeking to be asked about how they feel? Um, the first two the first two questions go to ideation. And the first one is um, have you 
wished you were dead or wished you could go to sleep and not wake up. Um, yes, or no, in the past month. Um, the second question is, have you actually had any thoughts about killing yourself? Um, if the answer is yes to both the questions, one and two, you go on to question three, four, and three, four, five, and six. If the answer is no to two, you go directly to, to um, question six. So it's really simple this. So question three, four, three, four, and five, um, goes to intent. Um, have you thought about how you might do this? Have you had any intention of acting on the on those on these thoughts of killing yourself, as opposed to have you had have the thoughts but definitely would not, not act on them? So there's somebody that would say, "I really want to die," mm. but they would never attempt suicide. So th there is a difference. Um, and then question five is, have you started to work out or um, worked out the details of how to kill yourself? Did you intend to carry out this plan? So questions four and five obviously puts the person into a, a high risk area. Question six is, have you done anything or started to do anything or prepared to do anything to end your life? For example, collected pills, um, bought a gun, gave away your valuables, wrote a will, was suicide note, hold, held a gun but changed your mind, cut yourself, tried to hang yourself, etc. Those are the questions. Anybody can ask these questions. Everybody can ask these questions because they're dealing with ideation and they're dealing with, with intent. So those are the questions. Thank you, Marcella. Charmaine, there's a question for you. What are the physical ailments that are related to suicide? Uh, there are quite a few. Uh, I mentioned in the context of neuropsychological uh, factors, there are certain regions of the brain that are related to um, suicidal behavior and ideation. Um, there are certain neurotransmitters, um, hormones that can impact on that behavior as well. But along with that, there are medical conditions as well. Um, like I, I, I've come across, or I've had experience, for example, with clients who are living with terminal illnesses like cancer, who are going through a lot of pain and trauma, and of course, then suicidal uh, behavior ideation is then linked to to what their experiences, um, physical disabilities as well. So quite a few mental, um, sorry, not mental, medical. Um, conditions as well, like I mentioned, your, your different cancers or illnesses um, that are also related to then suicidal behavior. Thank you, Charmaine. There's another question and anyone can answer this one. Are there any right or wrong questions to ask? Would like to tackle that. Um, I for me, it, I would just, I guess, uh, sort of shed light on not necessarily a question, but a comment or a statement, rather a response. So some having someone indicate that they've thought about committing suicide or plan to commit suicide, and then um, responding, you know, with a question asking them, you know, what about their family? Um, or I, I think in, 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 that, is, that is one that a lot of people I've, I've heard sort of ask people um, or even just in general conversation that exclude the person that's necessarily facing this challenge but just you know someone has committed suicide and then there's a conversation on oh but how could they do something like that what what's going to happen to their family what's going to happen to their children um, so that is a definite no no I'm from that thank you Nobisa Manisha your hand was up would you like to answer I think uh, Nobisa actually mentioned what I wanted to mention. It's just asking and having the open conversation. I think if someone is concerned, it's there's no right or wrong. I think it's always if if 
if the question comes from a space of non-judgment and complete support, and that person can actually sense that care, that that's why you're asking this, um, I think that's the most important factor. And also if that person says, you know, I'm absolutely fine, there's nothing wrong with me, it's for that person to also like, the, the concerned person to reiterate and be like, you know, I have been concerned. I am worried because I've noticed these things. I've noticed that you're not feeling well. I've noticed that you haven't been, you know, looking after yourself, or I've noticed that you haven't been eating or sleeping well. So I think it's about coming from that space of complete support and non-judgment. And I think that's the most, you know, it's, it's creating that holding space for that person to actually be able to share. And if they're not ready, that's absolutely fine to let them know it's absolutely fine, but I'm here if you do need that help. I'm, I'm here, I'm waiting for you to, to let me know when I can help you or if I can help you. Thank you, Venetia. Lorraine, there's a question to you. It says, what does a lay person do next? After asking questions and receiving affirmative answers, what does a friend, a family member do next? Yes, excellent question. Um, I see it's from Ange. Ange, I saw your doggy. Beautiful, beautiful doggy. Um, <laughs> so, so very much. I mean, I think the most important thing is, is uh, you know, is to remember that we cannot collude with the secret. So, um, even for practitioners and and professionals, you know, uh, the, the the confidentiality is limited when someone is disclosing that they're a risk to themselves or a risk to someone else. So that's the important thing is that we have to increase the circle of care. So as a lay person, um, it's being willing to hear and listen to this person and, and what's brought suicide into their life. But then we need to kind of look at, so where do we go from here? And if they, if, you know, if there's a, an imminent suicide plan, then we know that we have to engage hospitals, uh, psychiatric facilities, uh, doctors, um, you know, clinicians, uh, psychologists, so that there is a, a team that is then working with this person. So we cannot, t you know, kind of say, well, we'll deal with this just together on our own. We do need to, in in you know, increase this, the circle of care. Um, and, and if we don't know, well, who are those resources? What does it look like? Then we can, you know, phone SADC, ask, ask for their support. Um, uh, but we have to have to enable this person to to um, to reach out. And for me, the most important thing is is you know kind of encouraging working with a person to um, inform their family um, because while we in this really high risk space, this person should should not be alone. Um, and, sh and we also need to know what does the plan look like? Um, and you know is there a, a specific date and time? Um, because, you know, we have to then disable that plan, remove the access to, to you know, the, the, the means by which I was considering suicide, um, putting a safety plan in place, and there are excellent safety plans um, online, which all of us can do, is just kind of being aware of what are the trigger signs, what do I do to distract myself when I'm really in that bad space and suicide is imminent for me. Um, and then being able to, you know, to kind of phone someone just to, as a form of distraction, but also um, have a list of numbers that are available to me that I can phone to get, uh, you know, to, to get support. Um, but the most important, if there's imminent risk, if they're high risk right now, it, it is then to consider um, hospitalization and obviously, you know, uh, medical aid and hospitalization is a is a big issue uh, in terms of of the care in South Africa. But but it is um, you know a vital step in keeping that person safe. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Unfortunately, we are out of time. There are two more questions. If you have an opportunity panel to maybe pop a message quickly, you can do that. But I just want to say thank you so much and thank you for, this is actually very really good that we're getting questions now because it's an ongoing conversation um, that requires all of us to partake in. Um, but to the experts on the panel, Nwabisa, Lorraine, Marcella, Venetia, Shomain, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your expertise with us. Thank you all for attending. For some it might be morning, others afternoon or evening, we really appreciate your time. Um, we are sharing this recording 
that will be on our YouTube channel. So you can have a look there and any other resources from this webinar will be shared with you guys. So thank you so much. Have a lovely day and take care of yourself. Bye-bye, everyone.